Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Let's get to what, as you know, is our top national story. The collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore after container ships struck it, sending nearly the entire roadway structure uh, crumbling into the water. President Biden addressing the incident earlier from the White House. I told them we're going to spend all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. I mean, all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. All right. That, of course, was President Biden earlier from the White House. For the latest, let's head to Bloomberg co-host of Balance of Power, Kelly Lyon. She is on site in Baltimore. Uh, Kelly, a lot going on and new, new uh, information, obviously, about this situation continues to come out. So what's the latest? Get us up to speed. Well, Carol, right now this is still an active search and rescue effort, and officials here say that is still the number one priority. What we know is that at the time this happened, 1.30 a.m. Eastern time, when the dolly collided with a structural support of the bridge and it all came crashing down, there was a construction crew on the bridge working on fixing potholes, and a number of individuals fell into the water. Two have been rescued, one of which is hospitalized, but there are still six individuals unaccounted for. So that is really what everyone is focused on most immediately is that rescue operation. Then, of course, it will turn to other questions, including the clearing of the debris so that this port, a very busy port of Baltimore, may be able to get back open at some point in time. And of course, then there's the other effort of reconstructing this bridge. But again, there is no clear timeline. We heard as much from the Maryland Governor Wes Moore when he spoke to reporters earlier today. He really emphasized that the focus right now is on saving lives. He did not put a timeline on anything. And in the interim, traffic, commuter traffic, uh, you know, goods getting shipped over the roads and goods getting shipped in transit uh, by the waterways here around Baltimore are going to be disrupted. Kaylee, we did hear from the president that everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. What do we know about the accident? What do we know about the ship? What do we know about the crew on the dolly and, and just how this happened? Well, the Dolly, of course, is a ship that was Singapore flagged, had been chartered by Maersk and was carrying cargo of Maersk customers. Now, what is the law here in Maryland is that the ship actually needed to be piloted in Maryland waters by authorities uh, from the state. So that was who is, would have been in charge of the vessel at the time this happened. But our understanding at this point, based on the briefings uh, reporters have received uh, from authorities, is essentially that there was a power outage. They lost uh, propulsion, the ability to control the vessel. vessel and they did notify port authorities here in Maryland of that. So Wes Moore, actually, the governor, talked in the briefing about how authorities did have time to make sure that no more vehicles came onto the bridge. They were able to, able to halt more traffic because they did get warning a mayday from the ship that this was happening. But ultimately, this was a ship, according to the governor, that was traveling at eight knots speed uh, relatively fast, considering they were just coming down the river and ultimately could not be stopped from colliding into the structural support. So again, as we heard from the president, as we've heard repeatedly, from other authorities really just looks like a terrible, tragic accident that, of course, will have consequences human most immediately, regionally and even nationally as well. Kaylee, you've been on the ground for a few hours. Just describe the scene and what you've been uh, noticing over that time frame. Well, there are hundreds of people here, Carol, obviously a very large media presence from local media here in the, the DMV area to national media, as well as there have been other uh, trucks, things carrying equipment, even some trailers up to the point of the road that we at least are able to see. Of course, the road ultimately just hits a dead end and there is nothing beyond it because of that part of the bridge uh, had collapsed, but starting to see some equipment coming in. And of course, I am watching really at this hour uh, for any time now, this transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, is expected to be here on site at the invitation of Governor Moore to work with authorities here as this effort is underway. He will likely reiterate a lot of what we've already heard from President Biden in terms of the federal government providing support, not just to the search and rescue effort, but the reconstruction effort as well, and any funding that that might require. And even more immediately, I would point out at 2.30 p.m. Eastern time, we are expecting right here behind me, the NTSB, uh, to be delivering a briefing to the press. And of course, we'll keep all updated uh, on those developments as we get them. Yeah, and we will take uh those briefings live as we do get them. Hey, Kaylee, um, I, I know 
you mentioned it's a search and rescue operation is what's happening right now. That is mm -hmm. that is our focus. Um, and the other questions will, will certainly come later. It does raise questions about uh, what happens to shipping out of Baltimore uh, and yeah. what happens on the global shipping front. What can you tell us about the importance of the port and where some of the port traffic will go uh, and how this could snarl mm -hmm. a, a really delicate balance when it comes to global trade? Yeah, of course, we're all still reeling from the supply chain impacts we saw during COVID-19. And in some ways, that may make actually more cargo operators and those coordinating these shipments to be a little bit more prepared and being able to reroute things. But that will likely be necessary. And frankly, for an unknown period of time, as you allude to, Tim, this is a very important port. It is actually the busiest port in the country and has been for 13 years in a row in terms of the import and export of automobiles, of vehicles, cars, light trucks. Almost 850,000 of them went through this port in in 2023 and that is now uh, going to be likely heavily disrupted. We already of course have heard from uh, the Ford executives speaking on Bloomberg earlier talking about how they're going to need to reroute some things in terms of uh, car parts for example. GM has indicated they'll have to reroute as well and it's not just the auto industry that could be affected here. There's also a number of key commodities that come in and out of this port. One being coal. We're talking tens of millions of tons per year. That could be uh, disrupted in terms of those exports uh, for an unknown period of time. Really there's just a lot of transit uh, seaborne transit in particular that is going to have to go other, elsewhere, whether that's right. north to places like New Jersey and uh, New York and those ports there or south to the likes of Norfolk in Virginia. But it, there's going to have to be movement around. And that's just in terms of what moves over water. Of course, there is a huge part of I-695 that is now collapsed and is also submerged and, and ground traffic, commuter traffic and just freight distribution is going to be disrupted as well. All right. Going to leave it there. Hey, Kaylee, thank you so much. Bloomberg co-host of Balance of Power at Kaylee Lines. And we want to continue on the shipping impact and the significance of this port in Baltimore. Uh, it is one of the busiest ports, as we heard from Kelly, on the U.S. East Coast. With more on that side of the story, let's bring in Bloomberg News trade czar Brendan Murray joining us from London. Uh, Brendan, um, we know this is a major distribution hub, uh, the biggest in Maryland. Uh, specifically, share with us some more about size and scope and the significance of this port to the U.S. supply chain. Yeah, it's it's not a giant port for containers, but uh, as your previous guest mentioned, there are some. Uh, there's a diverse array of products that uh, and, and goods that move in and out of Baltimore: uh, cars, uh, coal, uh, gypsum, uh, and and a lot of the construction equipment. So you know, uh, and, and farming equipment. Uh, you know, it's it's we're getting close to planting season for farmers. We're getting close to sort of spring construction season. So so those kinds of things could cause some logistical uh, snarls or hiccups here in the in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of this cargo will will be diverted to to places nearby like New York or or Norfolk, Virginia, uh, although one of the major car terminals uh, that would be an option for Baltimore is in Brunswick, Georgia. And so that's, you know, hundreds of miles to the south. So you can imagine uh, the, the delays that are going to be uh, involved in shipping something from, uh, you know, Georgia, uh, you know, up the East Coast, as opposed to bringing it into Baltimore. So it's those kinds of wrinkles that are going to have to be worked out over the over the coming uh, weeks. Uh, but but you know they're still sort of untangling the mess. Uh, the, the the port itself, some of those auto terminals are on the ocean side of the bridge, so they're not going to be affected. Some of it, some of it is on the other side of the bridge, which which is apparently going to be closed for for a long time. So there's still a lot of details to work out about the extent of the of the disruptions. But it, it's they're going to be some uh, at least minor disruptions. Uh, for, for a while, uh, and they may turn into, they may sort of snowball uh, if if it uh, if they can't work these out um, well, that's, here over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. You use terms like hiccups and snarl and wrinkles. At what point do they become bigger disruptions that can affect the greater U.S. and perhaps even global economy? Is that possible with a tragedy like this? Well, you know, we saw you know, a pretty clear example during the pandemic that an extra 10 or 20 percent of cargo coming into another port that's not really ready for it can cause major uh, congestion. That's what happened in Los Angeles when a, a lot of consumer demand in the U.S. picked up. And you, you kind of had this uh, uh, sort of accordion effect where uh, the, the rail uh, the rail lines couldn't keep couldn't move the, the, the goods out of the port, and then the truckers you know couldn't move the you know so it just kind of has this uh, domino effect. So we definitely saw that. So if, if this cargo's got to divert elsewhere, 
the other ports, if there's not capacity to handle uh, and absorb the absorb that extra uh, cargo, then you could see ships backed up. Uh, to the extent to which we don't know yet, but that that kind of thing uh, can definitely happen as we've seen before. You know, Brendan, too, and I think, and you note this in your story, uh, let's not forget that, you know, distribution warehouses, right? It's always, we talk about it as a great real estate play, a lot of investors do, but nonetheless, there are some massive distribution warehouses from the likes of Amazon, FedEx, Under Armour, Home Depot, uh, car companies like around um, that area in particular. So I guess we're all kind of waiting to see what uh, those companies maybe say specifically about that, but that's another aspect to this story. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these distribution centers are, you know, are, there are many, many of them are automated. So, you know, you start throwing um, curveballs at them like this and, you know, there's a it kind of the whole system can kind of lock up. So uh, there are definitely uh, going to be problems regionally uh, with shipping uh, around Baltimore and the sort of the Philadelphia to Washington corridor. Uh, the truck traffic is going to be, uh, you know, all that all the uh, hazardous materials have to go over that bridge. Uh, that bridge now lo no longer is passable, so it's mm -hmm. going to have to go somewhere else. It can't go through the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel. So, you know, you're looking at, you know, uh, a lot of extra traffic is going to be pushed on different roadways. And, you know, that's the right. middle of the, the eastern corridor uh, where lots of goods flow uh, north and south. But as you said, still a lot to uh, work out. And we'll find out whether or not uh, what could be minor disrupt disruptions become something much more major. Um, Brendan, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg News Trades are Brendan Murray joining us there from London. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Okay, let's get uh, uh, a check, though, on the trade on this Tuesday with an update on that. Back over to John Tucker. All right, the major averages, Carol, still higher right now. The advance for the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ composite index approaching 10% since the start of the year. And the two-day pullback stocks, again, they were advancing today. And uh, the best performing stock in the S&P 500 right now, McCormick, it is up over 9% uh, right now, closing in on 10%. Again, that's the best performing stock in the S&P 500 after delivering an encouraging sales update. Worst performing stock right now, that belongs to United Parcel Service, 8% lower. Their revenue target beat estimates, but uh, Wall Street analysts kind of underwhelmed by the performance there. S&P 500, eight points higher right now. That's up two-tenths of a percent. 52.26 on the index. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 67 points, a rise of two tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq right now 40 points higher. That is up a quarter of a percent. And we check the markets for you all day long right here on Bloomberg Radio. I'm John Tucker, and that is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Carol and Tim. All right, John Tucker, so appreciate it. Hey, uh, John, of course, breaking down the trade. Don't forget, we did get some economic points uh, earlier today, some data points. It's a busy, chock full week, if you will, of economic data points. We had U.S. consumer confidence holding steady in March. Americans were sanguine about their current situations, Tim, but grew slightly more pessimistic about the outlook and then new orders uh, placed with U.S. factories for durable goods that rose in the month of February for the first time in three months. So suggesting that firms are somewhat optimistic about the direction of the U.S. economy. On that, gold earlier extended Monday's gain ahead of key U.S. inflation data, which we get on Friday, that could provide traders with a firmer view on when the Fed will start cutting interest rates. Gold did pair most of those gains, but still near an all-time high of uh, more than $2,200 per ounce. All right, so with a look at kind of the broader macro environment and also the precious metal space, we welcome the president of World Markets at Everbank. He is Chris Gaffney. He's here in studio. Everbank, by the way, uh, noting on its website, $36.2 in assets and $27.9 in deposits as of the end of 23. Um, Chris, nice to have you in studio. How are you? Uh, great, thanks. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. And I have to start, you guys think about about the broad macro uh, and things kind of coming at us. And I am curious um, if you have any thoughts about what's going on in Baltimore right now. We're looking once again very deeply and closely at U.S. supply chains. Right. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts in terms of your world and how you think about it might impact potentially if we see some supply chain disruptions in terms of higher prices, inflation, and we kind of, we know the story here. Exactly. So, you know, it, it will definitely lead to, if anything, um, higher inflation and a higher inflation reading with supply chain uh, disruptions, which could um, could lead the, the Fed to 
um, you know, stop rate cuts or actually pause on, on their planned rate cuts. Right now, we believe that the Fed pretty much has a predetermined uh, rate cut path, and it's really looking for reasons to knock them off their path mm. instead of reasons to cut. And, you know, I, I think June is, is definitely on the table, and, and they're, they're going to look to cut in June. And how many do you think will the Fed will do this? Well, year? they're still saying three, um, and not every member of the Fed, right? And and they they pulled back a little bit on their 2025. Um, uh, I think it's really dependent on you know where they they believe inflation, where this next PCE report comes in. They ignored the last two, um, and they seem to be tending to to look to let inflation run hotter for longer. Because um, they believe those longer term inflation expectations are anchored, right? They're sticking right. to that. And, and you know, they are in kind of a situation where um, with the amount of debt um, that we have here, uh, they need to lower interest rates, um, especially before it really has an impact on the on the global economy. And You're talking US about the economy. cost of servicing that exactly. debt. Exactly, that cost of servicing debt um, is going to take more and more of the of the budget of, of the U.S. budget. So by lowering interest rates, they'll have less debt service cost. Um, it's not one of their mandates, you know, Chris. I know it's it's. <laughs> hate to it's remind you, but strong labor hear, and and I didn't hear Powell didn't, say this at all during the press conference but, last week. But extra it's, mandate it's in there. The background and I, I do believe that and you many know, people have come on and said you know US debt you know all of a sudden I, you go back 10 years 20 years it's like every conversation was about it right uh, it's gone to the wayside but Larry it is Fink kind brought of it up this morning he did. Um, he did and you know by cutting rates they'll they'll ease that debt service um, and I, I really think that from what Paul was saying in his presser they're going to let inflation run a little hotter. I think they'll adjust their inflation uh, target. Uh, I don't think 2% is realistic, and I think they'll adjust their inflation target up. What that does to the markets, you know, is is 25 3% inflation going to kill the markets? I don't think so. And and I think they, they continue to lower rates. Why in, do they have to make that. that adjustment? Is it because the macro factors say we're in a very different environment post-pandemic? I think this is sticking inflation, and, and I think the the interest rates are going to settle at a higher level than the market's expecting right now. Because? Because of the higher inflation, the stickier inflation. And um, because of macro, like is it, like what is it that's changed in our inflationary environment? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, there, we had the supply chain uh, interruptions, but um, I think in general, the economy is doing well. The labor market is, is very resilient. Consumers are resilient. We've got very strong U.S. consumers. Um, they don't seem to be adjusting their spending. You know, confidence, while the longer term confidence is, is questionable, um, U.S. consumers are still very strong. So they're going to continue spending. Um, we see services continuing to, you know, inflationary uh, pressures on services. Any supply chain interruption, you know, that's going to add to inflationary pressures also. So let's get to gold and precious metals. Yeah. Um, given the narrative that you just gave, yeah. Why are we seeing gold near an all-time high? Well, absolutely. It's a, a it's kind of an inflation hedge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, traditionally it's shown as an inflation hedge. Um, but what we see on Everbank's World Market Desk is, is individual investors concerned about um, the global economy. They're using it as a uncertainty hedge or a catastrophe hedge. And we're seeing people come in, individual investors come in and want to own a hard asset. Um, one of the things that propelled gold to the record levels was central bank buying. And, and central banks were switching their reserves out of U.S. dollars into precious metal, into gold. Um, and I think some of the consumers are starting to, to start to do that also. And wanting that hard asset, wanting the diversification um, outside of just owning their traditional asset classes. Chris, because you do see so much on that platform, uh, quantify it for us. Is it back to levels we saw pre-pandemic? Is it, like, give us an idea of if you're seeing buying, how much has right. it, how much has it kind of picked up in terms of frequency? Well, the physical or buying isn't quite back to the levels we saw, you know, post-pandemic, we went through a silver shortage and, and we saw spreads mm -hmm. on the physical silver uh, widened dramatically. They're not back there yet. The spreads are, are narrower. Um, demand is up though, and, and we're seeing more and more demand and talking to individuals 
It's more about concern about where the global economy is uh, and, and the U.S. economy. The valuations on the equity markets, you know, seeing maybe some overvaluation there and uh, really pushing people to have, they want to have something to hold. So we're seeing the physical precious metals. We, we haven't seen so much the inflows into the ETFs. It's more the physical hmm. demand. Interesting. Okay, what about demand for, for Bitcoin? That's you, what I'm saying. Like, because when <laughs> Same we, thing? Yeah, well, when we, when we talk about, some, some people come on our program and say, our, our bull case for Bitcoin is that this is literally digital gold. Right, right. Um, do you believe it is? No. Um, I, I still Fixed think- Fixed supply. Yes. Uh, we know how much is there. Yeah, it's not controlled by any certain central government like fiat currencies are. So can't melt it, it does share some of those. It shares some of those. Is it a hard asset though? Is it, you know, where is it? Uh, where is it stored? You know, there's question marks. We haven't had a Mt. Gox in a while, but you know, questions about that is it's in the ether. So I think for some investors, they feel it's an alternative to gold. Um, I'm still, I, I think the jury's out. I, I think it's got to establish a, there's a long history with gold. And uh, so I think that is seen as the safe haven, the uncertainty hedge. People can trust that it's a hard asset. It's there in their portfolio. Um, I, I still feel Bitcoin is more speculation, especially with the volatility it has. Uh, you I guys mean, don't I offer think it on it's your more, platform, do you? No, we do not. We do not deal in, in, in crypto. Yet? We do not deal in <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're a, a bank. Yeah. So yeah. we're we're not encouraged to uh, deal in the, the crypto sphere. Right there now. are there are traditional banks getting into crypto. Sorry, go ahead, Carol. No, no, no. Well, I was just going to say 30 seconds because you guys are a bank and you do see so much. I mean, how do you describe the economy? And forgive me because I only do. We only do have about 30 seconds left. Here. Not a problem. So, you know, I, I think the U.S. economy remains strong, uh, mainly on the back of very strong and resilient U.S. consumers. Um, labor market still good. Um, so, you know, we'll see that the higher interest rates have not had an impact um, yet. And hmm. uh, I think the Fed is still going to go ahead and cut um, and trying to get us to this Goldilocks scenario where they can uh, cut rates and, and still keep inflation down while a strong labor market. So no stress points real quickly. Oh, there's uh, the debt, the debt levels and in, in on both consumer and government is really the stress level. And that's the real question mark. Uh, and then, of yeah. course, the geopolitical tensions. So appreciate it. Thank you so much and for going along with us because we know we had a lot of breaking news. Chris Gaffney, thank you. President of World Markets at Everbank, joining us in studio. Traveling in my car, I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. It's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That punk music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, TikTok, everybody, just about seven minutes left in the Tuesday trading session. And for a second day in a row, we're seeing some selling here into the close. Uh, we're pretty much just around our worst levels, if not at our worst levels, as John Tucker just mentioned, for the S&P Dow and the NASDAQ 100. So let's get to our drive to the close guest. Uh, yeah, we got with us Leo Kelly, founder and CEO at Verdance Capital Advisors. He joins us from Hunt Valley, Maryland. Leo, good to have you back with us. Look, before we talk markets, you're joining us from just north of Baltimore, uh, only about half an hour from the collapsed Francis. Scott Key Bridge. We've been covering the story all day. We're thinking about everyone affected by the tragedy. Just give us an idea about how important this bridge is that crosses the um, outer harbor. Well, it's it's the east side of Baltimore, and it is a uh, significant thoroughfare. Um, so the disruption is going to be pretty extraordinary, um, especially because the folks on just on either side of that bridge, uh, the next path from one side to the other is a long, long commute. Plus, you've got the port shut down. So um, it's an extraordinary event. Obviously, it's at the uh, the front of everybody's mind here in Baltimore and in the surrounding area. So we're praying for the folks that are impacted both both now and over the next uh, the, the next couple of years. And, and Baltimore, um, Baltimore didn't need this break. 
So uh, we're hoping this will be a quick recovery, obviously. Yeah, we do, too. And we've certainly heard from the president, from the transportation secretary and other officials saying that this is going to be certainly priority and they're going to commit whatever efforts and, I guess, money, it sounds like, in federal funds to get this done uh, as quickly as possible. You know, having said that, Leo, um, and we certainly we know that there's still a lot to be known and there's, you know, lives that's, you know, that we're waiting to hear if there's been, you know, lives lost and so on and so forth. But it made me kind of think, you know, we live in a world where we are constantly reminding that things can come at us um, from unexpected directions, um, different magnitudes, uh, different scale, if you will, but it kind of keeps us on our toes. And we're waiting to assess how much of this might have an impact on the U.S. supply chains and a lot to be known. And obviously, the longer it's a problem, the longer it or, or the, the higher potential for it to become a supply chain problem. Having said that, how do you think about kind of where we are in this market environment? Um, does it feel tenuous at all? Does it feel like sure footed? How do you see it? It, it does feel a little bit tenuous. You know, today's acti activity aside, um, it does feel a little bit tenuous. And I think it feels tenuous because you have a pocket of the market that's running up to extraordinary levels. I think the last time we were on, we were talking about um, some of the AI bubble that was brewing. Um, and and we're, we're really at this interesting uh, tug of war right now. The Fed is still trying to battle back inflation. Inflation is being very persistent. And we've talked about this before. It's just because there's so much capital flushing around in the system. So um, the market is excited about the fact that the economy is being resilient. It's excited about the fact that inflation has slowed. But I would stress, slowing inflation is still inflation. And the Fed is still fighting it. So I, I, I think one of the challenges that the economy has, that the market has, is that when the Fed gets more aggressive, inflation does slow, but then we start to see an economy showing danger signals. So the Fed slows down or stops uh, rates. I, I mean, this concept of six rate cuts this year I always thought was absurd because as soon as you start to get the least bit dovish, the inflation numbers start to signal higher again. So this is going to be an interesting tug of war with valuations higher, um, and so, and we haven't had much volatility for the since October. Um, I do think this is a time for discipline, quite frankly. Hey, Leo, very briefly, um, what are the, some of those warning signs that you're starting to see, if any, right now? Well, I, I think you have a mixed message uh, around the economy. Small business confidence has been down. Inflation is going back up. Um, you know, we, we get mixed messages with the uh, ISM surveys versus the employment numbers. So I, I think that's one of the first challenges, right? Some of the lead indicators. Um, and, and so really what's interesting about this current economic data that's coming out is anybody who wants to come to a conclusion can find the data. If you want to be positive, you can find the data. If you want to be negative, you can find the data. Where I'm concerned right. is that inflation has remained pers persistent. Got it. And the Fed, I mean, the Fed keeps talking about the fact that they're going to cut rates and they just start to get a little more dovish. Okay. Forgive us. Forgive us, Leo. We've got to run. We'll check in with you soon. Leo Kelly, founder and CEO at Verdon's Capital Advisors uh, there in Maryland. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. On Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.